I'd also like to thank a bunch of departments. Uh, aside from the International Studies Institute, uh, there's a lot of other departments and programs on campus who have helped support this. Those include anthropology, Africana studies, <laughs> um, foreign languages and literatures, um, religious studies, um, political science, um, and for this lecture, oh, political science for this lecture specifically. Uh, so these, these, are, these are groups and organizations that have helped us a lot as well. So just, just so you know, that it's, a, it's not just us, it's, not, it's a much more of a group effort. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our introducer, uh, <laughs> whose name is Sarah Gutierrez. Uh, she actually just graduated recently from UNM with a double major in philosophy and political science and a minor in peace studies. Wow. Uh, she is also the secretary general of the World Affairs Delegation. And that's the one group I haven't mentioned yet because they've also supported this. But I wanted to wait because I wanted to link it up with Sarah. Because the World Affairs Delegation is a student group on campus that deals a lot with international issues. They do a lot of model UN type work, but they do some other stuff as well. So, if you have questions about maybe getting involved with the World Affairs Delegation, you might want to talk with Sarah afterwards. Uh, Sarah is now doing her uh, MA here at UNM in Public Administration, and she is working in GEO, Global Education Office. Uh, specifically, she works with the Passport Center and with just general study abroad issues. So you can talk to her about those things too, I suppose. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Um, so like you said, my name is Sarah Gutierrez. Uh, so I'm representing the World Affairs Delegation. Um, so I'm going to be introducing our, our guest of honor today, our speaker. Um, Ambassador Mark <coughs> Esquino um, is a career foreign service officer with the rank of minister counselor. He retired from the U.S. Department of State in November of 2015. Ambassador Esquino's three decades plus <coughs> career Includes <coughs> included postings in Latin America, Europe, Central Asia, and Africa. During 2012 to 2015, he served as the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Equatorial Guinea. Upon completing his assignment there, the government of Equatorial Guinea awarded him the country's highest decoration, the Grand Cross of the Order of Independence. Ambassador Espinos previously served as Deputy Chief of mission in Sudan and in Kazakhstan. In Washington, he was Chief of Staff to the Office of the Undersecretary for Civilian Se Security, Democracy, and Human Rights at the U.S. Department of State. Earlier in his career, Ambassador Espino was Deputy, Deputy Coordinator in the Office of the Coordination for Reconstruction and Stabilization at the Department of State and Director of the U.S. Cultural Center in Madrid. The ambassador is fluent in Spanish and has a working knowledge of French, Russian, and Romanian. Prior to entering the Foreign Service, Ambassador Esquina spent a year um, from 1975 to 1976 as a Fulbright lecturer in American Studies at the University of Oviedo, Austria, in Spain. The ambassador earned his PhD in American Civilization from Brown University, where he also did his undergraduate studies. He is currently serving on the board of directors for the Santa Fe Council on International Relations. Please give a warm welcome to Ambassador Mark Espino. Sarah, you know, when I, I hear all of this, I think, God, I must be really old to have done all those things. Um, I really do want to thank um, both uh, Dr. Stewart and Dr. Bishop uh, for this opportunity to, to speak. Um, I think this is a wonderful series on peacemaking in Africa. Uh, I'm going to speak about South Sudan. South Sudan uh, is Africa's newest nation. Came independent on July 9, 2011. And the United States played a large role in bringing about the independence of South Sudan. And on the historic day when it became independent, Secretary Hillary Clinton, who was secretary at the time, made a very interesting and, and I think statement that I, I reflect on. If, if we could have the next slide. <clears throat> so she said coming into that day of independence, uh, 
This weekend in Juba, South Sudan, Africa's 54th nation will be born. Millions of people are celebrating new national identity and new national promise. Like our own Independence Day some 235 years ago, there is reason for hope for a better future if the people and leaders of both Sudan and South Sudan commit themselves to the hard work ahead. But just as independence was not inevitable, neither is a lasting peace between Sudan and South Sudan. South Sudan must address its internal challenges. Its people face wrenching poverty, inadequate health care, and the continuing presence of armed militia groups. I hadn't read that statement in a long time. Uh, it's a much longer statement, but I, I take that portion out because as I read it again after several years, it strikes me that what Secretary Clinton had to say was sadly prescient. While celebrating South Sudan's independence uh, and its future promise, at the same time, she was quite aware of the challenges and also the risks that this new nation had of descending into chaos, particularly if it failed to address its external and its internal challenges. Well, on December 15, 2013, just two and a half years after that July 11th Independence, 2011 Independence Day, a brutal civil war broke out in South Sudan. And it pitted the forces of President Salva Kiir, uh, who belonged to the majority Dinka tribe, about 50% of the population of South Sudan, and Vice President Rik Mashar, who was a newer uh, tribe that has about 30%. Uh, war broke out just months after Salva Kiir had fired Rik Mashar, uh, as his vice president. Uh, that happened in July 2013, and by December, uh, there was a full, full sort of fledged war. And that waged almost without any interruption until last year uh, on September 12th. During those five years of conflict, some 400,000 South Sudanese died. Uh, and there were massive ethnic killings. Uh, there was the systematic rape of women and girls as a weapon of warfare. And there was widespread starvation. More than 1.9 million people from a total population of just over 12 million became internally displaced uh, during those five years. And another 2.2 million fled the country. Uh, they found refuge in Uganda, in Sudan, and in the Re Republic of Congo. So what happened? Here you had a situation in 2011 when 98% of South Sudanese voted for independence. And Yet less than three years later, the country totally imploded and it sunk into a wave of killing and unthinkable atrocities. Uh, so how can we account for this? And what do we learn from it? Uh, and finally, going back to the title of, of this talk, what, what are the prospects for peace, prosperity, recovery in South Sudan? Well. Before I get there, I want to talk a little bit about the peace that occurred in 2018. There was a ceasefire uh, signed in Ethiopia. Uh, it called for a new government of national unity with Salva Kiir, uh, the Dinka, uh, as president, and with Rik Mishar uh, as his vice president. Originally, in that peace treaty, the new government of unity was to be formed in May. That did not happen. Uh, the deadline is now November 12th. That's just less than a month from now. Um, and as we look at that, I think there are some real questions. I mean, after all, these are the same two gentlemen uh, that we know hate each other, uh, that... 
were uh, on opposite sides for a time during the Sydney Civil War, which I will, uh, uh, war with the North rather, which I will talk about, uh, and are largely responsible for taking Sudan into civil war. So this alone is cause for skepticism and concern. On a personal note, I was deputy chief of mission in Khartoum, South Sudan at our embassy from 2008 to 2010. And in that position, I, I frequently went to Juba, the capital of South Sudan. Part of my, my job was really assisting in building institutions. There, there were two possibilities at that point. Uh, after a six year period after peace was signed originally between the North and South, uh, that there might be a unified Sudan with both sides feeling part of the future of that country. Um, so this is personal for me. I, I look back on what happened in Sudan from 2013 to 2018. I reflect on it. I have a lot of second thoughts, and I'll, I'll be happy to share those with you. Um, let me say that the, the history and the politics of Sudan is enormously complex. Uh, I, I served in 10 countries during a 37-year career in the Foreign Service. Uh, in, as the, was said in the introduction, in Latin America, in Europe, Central Asia, the, the complexity of Sudan really challenges anybody. In that six-year period also, uh, looking at whether or not South Sudan would stay unified with the North or become independent is, is also very complex. Um, there were three countries that were involved with Sudan and South Sudan making peace in, 2050, uh, in 2005 in what was called the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Uh, it was brokered by what's called the Troika, uh, United States, Great Britain, and Norway. Um, in general terms, you can look at the conflict within Sudan, the, the civil war, as being one between two men, uh, Salva Kiir, uh, Adinka, and Rik Mishar, uh, a newer. But I have to say that is something of an oversimplification. Uh, neither tribe is monolithic. There are divisions within them. There have been intertribal wars uh, during their history. Uh, there has been leadership struggles, people shifting sides, uh, warlords taking different views. Um, and there are smaller tribes. Uh, there's the Shilak, there's the Muir, there's the Equatorians. Uh, and they've also unfortunately found themselves in the crossfire um, between these two big tribes. Uh, there are issues with land use between pastoralists, people who are nomadic, uh, and settled people, uh, farmers, um, over use of resources, over use of water. Um, there are states in the north, South Kordofan, Nuba Mountains, Blue Dial, uh, that remained in northern Sudan, even though their affinities are very much with the south. Uh, and they continue to this day waging guerrilla warfare. They do not want to be part of Sudan. I can't address all of these other issues. I, I wish I could. Uh, I don't have the time. Uh, I'm happy to take any of your questions on them. Um, but I'd like to focus tightly on one central issue today. What happened to that promise of South Sudan in 2011? The Secretary's words were guarded. They reflected, I think, a sense that things could go wrong, but a hope that they would not. Um, and finally, I'll talk about the future of peacemaking, what I, what I think can happen. But before I do that, I need to give you a very brief historical sketch of Sudan and South Sudan. Historians writing about the North and the South have time and time again said they're very different. Uh, the northern part of Sudan, uh, for a long time in its history, uh, shared uh, institutions, ideas, including religion, uh, with Egypt. Um, 
They uh, were viewed by many as being racially and culturally Arabs. And the people in the South uh, were viewed as being black Africans. Um, for generations, uh, people living in the South were victimized by Arab raiders coming from the North uh, and Europeans. They were enslaved. And that sense of resentment between the North and the South exists to this day. Uh, when I was in Sudan, um, I didn't have much Arabic, but I, I, I knew slurs for black people, and I often heard them uh, mentioned in Arabic. Um, there was a colonial period from 1899 to 1955. Great Britain and Egypt uh, were in what was called a condominium uh, as the colonial powers, although Great Britain certainly was the dominant of the two in administering Sudan. And the British administered Sudan separately as the North and the South. Uh, those living in and around Khartoum became known as the Riverine Arabs. Uh, they were an elite. Um, Ethnically, one can make the argument that they really were not completely Arabs, but they took an Arabic identity uh, in terms of their language uh, and in their embrace of Islam. Um, the South was administered separately, uh, and the British restricted travel by Northerners to the South. They had, they had a really patronistic view of the South that somehow these poor, underdeveloped black Africans in, in the South would be taken advantage by these more sophisticated Northerners. Uh, in the end, what happened in the South was that pretty much left to their own, without the British investing much in education or medical care, uh, Norwegian uh, missionaries came in, and that may sound odd because Norway is not known as a country much involved in Africa. But they became very much involved in the South in terms of education, in terms of religion, in terms of building some basic institutions uh, that were Western to a degree, secular values, ideas. Um, well, one result of this is that the North continued to dominate despite this. Uh, the South remained relatively underdeveloped despite the uh, influence of, of the missionaries. And the people in the, North, in the South became rather marginalized. In the 1930s, uh, the British had a policy. It was called the Southern Policy. And it totally cut off the South from all travel by anyone from the North. And there was a time uh, when the British considered breaking off southern Sudan uh, from the north and allying it with the east, with the English-speaking countries such as Uganda. Um, that didn't happen. But the two countries developed along very different lines of, of this Arabic north and basically Christian and animist south, indigenous beliefs, indigenous language, uh, English became the dominant language uh, of the South. Uh, instruction by the missionaries was in English. Arabic remained uh, a dominant language in the North, although the British also instructed people in English. If you look at the post-independence history of Sudan, you can say it's characterized by the South's resistance to being forced to have an Arabic identity in terms of language and its, its sense of who the people are. Uh, in 1955, the British were planning the independence of Sudan. There was a large garrison of troops in the south. They were all from the tribes of southern Sudan. And the British fearing that when the country became independent, given the south's absolute fear and resistance to having the Northerners impose their identity, that what the British should do would be to bring back the soldiers, um, bring them to the North, even, even though they were Southerners. Uh, South didn't go along with this. There was a revolt in 1955. It began the first war between the North and the South. 
It lasted from 1955 to 1972. Uh, and it was largely guerrilla warfare by the South at that point. In 1972, there was a peace agreement, the Addis Ababa Agreement. Uh, and the country at the time in the North was under the rule of a general by the name of Ghaffar Nimeri. And he gave limited autonomy to the South. Uh, this lasted until 1983. And in 1983, Nimeri, who had become increasingly connected with political Islam, decided that the South was going to be pulled in fully to the North. And he declared that Sharia law, which was the law in the North, would become the law in the South. And that any institutions that were connected with semi-autonomy would be banned. So this led to the Second War, which began in 1983. It's a conflict that cost both sides from 1983 to 2005, two million lives. The immediate cause of the Civil War, as I've said, was the South's refusal uh, to meet these conditions. In the course of that war, there was a military coup. In 1989, it brought to power uh, someone by the name of Omar al-Bashir. Al-Bashir was recently overthrown in Khartoum last year. Different story, we could talk about another occasion. Um, but he came to power in a pro-Islamist uh, party, the National Islamic Front, uh, which eventually became the National Congress Party. And the warfare continued. Uh, and again, it was this ideological, religious, cultural, racial split between the two sides. And under al-Bashir, uh, he took an increasingly pro-Islamist -is uh, and anti-Western stance. By 2005, uh, there were enormous efforts to bring about peace. And there were three nations uh, who worked with both sides. Uh, they were called the Troika. Um, one was the United States. The other was Great Britain, the former colonial power. And the third was Little Norway, um, which continued to have an investment in the South. Uh, this peace agreement uh, had a six-year period. Uh, where the semi-autonomous government of southern Sudan uh, was allowed to keep its own army, uh, was allowed to have its own institutions. Um, by this point, uh, Sudan was a major producer of oil. It was the third largest producer of oil and gas uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And even though most of the oil wells are on the southern side of the border between the north and the south, uh, nevertheless, um, and maybe we'll go to the next slide so I can show the, uh, most of the oil wells are right up near uh, Bentiu and they're in Abia, which is uh, disputed. Despite this, uh, the south got a 50% share of the oil that was produced. The idea was that during the six-year period, the, the official policy was to work on the benefits of unity. But at the end of those six years, the people of South Sudan had the right to vote on independence or staying within Sudan. Um, so let's see. I've gone a couple pages beyond where I, I was. Um, so we have talked about this colonial period. Um, and basically what we had uh, during this interim period um, up until 2011 um, was a government in which the Dinkas, who were represented by General Salva Kiir, uh, and the Nuers, who were represented by a man by the name of Rik Mishar, basically shared power. Uh, during the war, there had been a leader of the Dinkas, a man called John Garang. And John Garang uh, had led the Civil War. Uh, he was killed in a plane crash before uh, the signing, uh, or shortly after the signing of the 2005 peace agreement. John Garang, who was educated at Iowa State, um, had lots of friends in the US, 
uh, advocated for something called a new, new Sudan. Um, he really wanted to see the two sides come together. Um, one can glorify John Garang. Uh, a lot of people think that had he lived, the history of Sudan might be different. Um, but when he died in some ways, uh, the dream of a united Sudan, one that brought together everybody, also died. Uh, Salva Kiir was an advocate for independence. Um, and during the six year period, uh, the South wound up getting something along the orders of $12 billion uh, in aid. Uh, that came, were not aid, actually revenue. Uh, during that period, the US was very much involved. Uh, USAID had a number of people who were enhancing capacity uh, building, improving education, economic development. All of those things had been ignored, in many cases destroyed, uh, during uh, the war uh, with the North. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, please. The president of the country, of the autonomous country at that, or semi-autonomous, was uh, Salva Kiir. Um, he came from the Dinka tribe. He was not a tremendously well-educated man. Um, he had a military background. He had a very hard time adopting to a civilian role as president. Uh, Rik Bashar um, was someone who was really quite different. Uh, he came basically from the ruling elite uh, of the newer tribe. Uh, he was educated in Khartoum and then at the University of Bradford. Um, speaks beautiful English. Uh, had occasion to, to meet him. Uh, these people were unfortunately deadly enemies. <laughs> In 1991, during the war that had started back uh, after a um, period of peace between the North and the South, um, Rik Mishar switched sides basically and with aid from the North uh, battled his former co colleagues, um, people um, who were fighting uh, for the independence of the country. Um, when peace was about to occur between the two sides, uh, the, the agreement that came about uh, in 2005, um, he suddenly switched sides back. But because he was the leader of the second largest tribe in Sudan, he was taken back into the fold, but with enormous amounts of, I think, suspicion. Uh, the two sides had fought during the war. There had been atrocities. Um, so as a result of this, there, there was bad feeling. There was a sense of betrayal. And this was a difficult relationship during the period leading up to the final 2011 uh, decision on whether the South would remain part of the North or whether it would wind up uh, becoming independent. Um, during that period, uh, from the oil, 50% share that South Sudan got, uh, the South got $12 billion. And this came about because Sudan was the third largest producer of oil in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Kerry used the money basically to pay off political opponents. Uh, he kept the military in line. Um, when peace was established uh, back in 2005, there were roughly 40,000 members of the uh, South Sudan People's Liberation Army, the SPLA. Uh, by the time the South became independent, there were 200,000. Uh, it was the largest standing army in the world based on population. Um, and during this period as well, um, it had more generals um, in 2011 uh, who ate up, along with the soldiers, about half of the country's budget, uh, again, than any other country. Um, 
On top of this, there was massive corruption uh, during the period from 2005 uh, to 2011. Uh, Mashar and his uh, Noor, uh, his Noor uh, elites, uh, and um, Salva Kiir uh, skimmed off hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the majority of South Sudanese, uh, including those from other regional tribes, uh, like the Shilluk and the Equatorians, remained in dire poverty. Um, but there were financial problems almost immediately after independence. Um, once there was a referendum and the South voted uh, by 98% to become independent, uh, the breakdown of oil revenue changed quite a bit because most of the oil wells were along uh, the southern border. And so they wound up with 75% uh, of the oil producing wells. But the refineries, uh, and the port, uh, because as you saw from the uh, slide, South Sudan is landlocked, the oil had to go out the Red Sea, and that was in the north. Well, in the first six months, um, the north and the south got along. Uh, the north said, fine, we get our 25%, you get your 75%, um, and we will uh, basically not charge you to ship the oil and refine it. But that only lasted six months. And the North then said, no, we think we're gonna charge you. And what they were going to charge, both for shipping and for refining, and then getting the oil out of the country, uh, was enormously high. There was no agreement between the two sides. And so Salva Kiir, uh, in a moment of <laughs> grand sort of anger, said, well, fine, I'm gonna shut down the whole thing. <laughs> And in the case of the South, the South was deriving 98% of its revenue from oil. It's the highest of any place in the world. About 80% of the North uh, depended on oil revenue. But the South was devastated. And the South wound up taking out loans uh, at very high rates based on the future production of oil. And Salva Kiir had been able to keep people happy um, when there was a lot of oil re revenue during that period uh, from 2005 to 2011 by paying off his enemies, paying off the army, generals, uh, anybody who opposed him. But once that stopped, um, he couldn't do that. Enrique Mishar said in 2012 with the economy crashing, I'm gonna run against you for president in 2015. Uh, this did not sit well uh, with Salva Kiir, uh, and he dismissed Rik Mishar as the vice president uh, in the summer of 2011, uh, 2013, sorry. Uh, there was no political opposition because the Dinkas were the majority tribe, and the political party, which had been the South Sudan People's Liberation Army, was now a, a political party, which had transformed itself into a political division. They didn't oppose this. The reaction of Mashar was to accuse Salva Kiir of dictatorial tendencies. Well, this did not last very long. Uh, the army actually, even though the Dinka are in the majority, uh, most of the people, higher percentage of Noor, were in the army. And this was something that Salva Kiir feared. He brought in private Dinka militia uh, into the capital. And on December 15, 2013, Dinka soldiers and militia loyal to Kiir began to slaughter the newer uh, members of the South Sudan People Liberation Movement Army. Uh, they didn't stop there. Uh, they went from the army headquarters and they began to slaughter people in the city of Juba, uh, which is the capital in the south. Um, this went on for three days. Uh, the very, I would say, conservative estimate is that some 600 uh, Newar were murdered. These were women, children, civilians. Um, 
What happened after that is that uh, Rik Mishar and his family escaped. They wound up uh, fleeing to actually the, the north up past Malakal. And they regrouped. And all of a sudden, you had the surviving soldiers from uh, the uh, army who were newer, along with militia beginning to murder Dinka. And this was an absolute uh, disaster. Kier justified this by saying that Rik Mishar had staged a coup against his government. But in 2015, there was a, an African Union Commission of Inquiry. And that commission said no, that there had been no coup. Uh, rather that this attack by the Dinka against the Nur had been a power play, that it had been attended uh, as ethnic clean cleansing, that there had been tanks and heavy weaponry uh, to assist the soldiers when they went into Juba to, to kill people. Mashar and his family barely uh, escaped and went north uh, to Malakal. Um, during this period, uh, there was a UN peacekeeping mission in South Sudan called UNMIS, and it was one of the largest in the world. And it had protection of civilian centers, and thousands of civilians seeking protection went to these centers. But the criticism of UNMIS, as it was called, uh, is that even though it had Chapter 7 authority under the United Nations, that means that it has the right to protect civilians. Uh, the troops didn't come out of the barracks. Uh, they basically stayed there. And so you had a situation in the next years uh, of horrendous revenge killings by Nur against Dinka and Dinka against Nur. Uh, Rik Mashar began his own political movement called the, South, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement in Opposition, the SPLMIO. Um, there was a, a militia on the Nur side called the White Army. They marched on Juba, and it was only Uganda sending in troops uh, that saved uh, Salva Kiir and his government from falling. Uh, the Civil War uh, basically descended into something that some people have described as being much akin to the Rwanda genocide. Neighbors became involved, Uganda, Sudan, Ethiopia. Uh, there were profiteers uh, involved. And there's an excellent book on South Sudan, on what happened, on someone who was the BBC correspondent uh, in the South at the time. It's called First Rays of Flag, How South Sudan Won the Longest War but Lost the Peace. And the gentleman uh, who wrote the book is named Peter Martel. And I'd, I'd like to read you just a little bit of what he wrote because it, it really does resonate with what happened in Su South Sudan. He says, the fratricidal bloodshed destroyed the very fabric of society. The collapse was quick because institutions were absent. The normal ties of authority and civilian security to reign in madness. Government, police, civil service, and the judiciary were paper thin. The little infrastructure that wasn't already broken or battered into dust was totally destroyed in the conflict. Sudan split into two because those excluded from power were driven to take up arms and seize it. Well, in response, the, the Troika countries, the US, Britain, and Norway, along with the UN, did everything that they could to try to stopped the killing, there were ceasefires which, which failed, there were peace talks. In the first year of the war, uh, those three countries, the Troika, spent $20 million trying to bring about peace, um, and the war raged on. Um, some of the things that happened during the war were so graphic that I, I won't share with you, but as somebody who spent two years in Sudan, spent a lot of time in the South, um, I have to say that I find it very hard sometimes to, to read about what happened. I had great affection uh, for both the Northerners and the Southerners. Um, I was aware when I was in Sudan from 2008 to 2010 
that there was corruption in the Kier government. Uh, we reported on it. Uh, we talked about the fact that despite the $12 billion, South Sudan was not building strong institutions. Uh, and we had great concerns. And I, along with a number of my colleagues in the embassy, uh, went, talked to people. Um, some of that was listened to in Washington, some of it was not. Um, there was a tendency during that period uh, to view the South as favorable, uh, despite the fact that the corruption was, was pretty, uh, pretty obvious. Um, 2016, there was a brief period of peace. It was brokered by uh, an organization called the Intergovernmental Authority for Development, or IGAD. And IGAD uh, brings Africans into the peacemaking process. The countries in IGAD are Djibouti, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan, and Uganda. Um, what they proposed was a return to the unity government between Kir and Mashar. Uh, after many delays in 2016, uh, Rik Mashar went back to Juba, to the capital, but he brought a large armed force with him. Disagreements between the two sides developed immediately. And it soon became apparent that you had two opposing armies that were both sitting in the capital of Juba, and it wouldn't take much for the peace to blow up. It, it only took three months. Uh, there was an incident between the two sides. It's never been clear who shot whom, but it brought about open warfare between Mashar and Kir's armies. Uh, and Mashar again fled, uh, this time with his troops, the, uh, SPL, uh, the SPLM uh, in opposition, IO. They were pursued by the Ugandan Air Force. Uh, they eventually took refuge in the Republic of Congo. Um, making things even worse uh, was that in 2018, there was a famine in South Sudan. The reason for that famine was not drought. It was not anything that was natural in cause. It came about because both sides destroyed wells. They killed farmers. Uh, they used famine as a tool of war. And by early 2018, the UN estimated that some one million people were on the brink of starvation. Uh, a large number of international aid workers during this period, including US citizens, uh, were caught in the crossfire. There were people who were murdered, women were raped. It, it was, one estimate says it was the most dangerous place in that year to be as a US assistance officer. <clears throat> in February of 2018, the Trump administration imposed an arms embargo on South Sudan sanctions against people uh, around uh, Kier. In July, the UN Security Council passed a resolution, uh, again, an arms embargo against Juba. Salva Kier, by this time, had become a complete authoritarian or dictator leader. Uh, he uh, squelched any free expression. Uh, he closed down independent media. Uh, and he jailed and in some cases killed anyone in opposition. But by 2018, it, it had become clear to everybody uh, that neither side was going to win uh, militarily. And my sense in looking at this from afar was that there was a war weariness that had come. The country had been pretty much destroyed. The battles had been fierce. So in September of 2018, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, which I'd mentioned, hosted peace talks. <clears throat> and there was a peace treaty signed uh, last September. It is called the Revitalized Agreement on the Resolution of Conflict in the Republic of South Sudan, which is a mouthful. Uh, it is abbreviated as R. Arcus. Uh, and this was initialed by the two sides. There were other groups that signed it, um, smaller political parties, church leaders, people in civil society. Uh, the original agreement called for the formation of 
another unitary or uh, united government between President Salva Kiir and the first vice president in May of 2019. That deadline came and it went. And the new deadline for coming together in a unity government is November 12th. And that's, as we know, just a month off. Um, after that three-year period, there should be national elections uh, to choose new leadership. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is the third time that these two guys have come together. And I, I often think of that, that old saying, um, insanity is doing the same thing time and time again and expecting a different result. Uh, so I sometimes scare, share skepticism about these two people being the ones who are going to form a, a government. At the same time, I'd like to share a few positives uh, in the last year in terms of peacemaking. There was testimony uh, last month uh, during the UN General Assembly, during the, the opening, by the UN uh, Secretary General uh, Special Representative for South Sudan, uh, a, man, a gentleman by the name of David Shearer. <clears throat> and Shearer brought up three points that were positive. First of all, he said that the ceasefire uh, that had come into effect in September of 2018 had largely held. Uh, he said that political violence had decreased and that there had been a slight improvement in food security. Uh, and he said that close to 600,000 uh, South Sudanese who had fled to Uganda, Sudan, other countries had begun to return. In the last year, the United Nations has hosted 130 grassroots level peace building meetings. Uh, Salva Kiir and uh, Rik Mashar met in September. Um, supposedly, the, the talks were cordial, even though the, the, the two men regard each other as, as enemies. The other thing that occurred is that oil production has begun once again in South Sudan. Um, I lived in a lot of oil producing countries in my career. And I have to say that I always view oil production uh, and revenue based on oil as being a real double-edged sword. But at least in South Sudan, it is bringing about some modicum of economic stability. Um, there was a press conference uh, on the margins of the UN uh, last month. And David Shearer was asked if he was optimistic about peace holding uh, between the two sides. And he was decidedly cautious, as I think I would be, were I in his position. Uh, he said he was optimistic because of the advances, um, but at the same time, uh, he felt that there had to be political will uh, between the two sides. The US, Great Britain, and Norway uh, did not sign the agreement in 2018. Uh, they have been very skeptical that these two sides uh, can come together with Salva Kiir and Rik Mishar. Uh, and the Department of State uh, has said that unless the two sides come together, uh, by November 12th, there will be more sanctions, particularly on the elite around uh, both Mashar and uh, Salva Kiir. Um, I'll conclude this uh, by going back to my question. Can Africa's newest nation ever find peace and prosperity? Um, call me the eternal optimist, I suppose. I mean, I've served in places like South Sudan and Central Asia. I have a qualified yes, and if you could put up the, the last slide. Um, I have a few caveats. Um, I think that until Salva Kiir and Rik Mishar uh, are no longer part of the peace process, uh, I can't see long-term peace and prosperity coming to South Sudan. Uh, the men are incredibly corrupt. They are guilty of war crimes. Uh, ethnic cleansing, atrocities. Um, it's hard for me to imagine a long-term partnership. At the same time, it's up to the people of South Sudan to decide who their leaders are, not the international community. 
Uh, so while I would like to see both of these guys gone, uh, I don't see either as stepping down voluntarily right now from power. Um, second issue is on accountability and justice. We've seen in other places, in Africa and throughout the world, uh, a need for a mechanism uh, to achieve understanding, healing. There are three such mechanisms in the 2018 peace agreement. Um, none of them has been formed yet, um, but we very much hope that they will and that that process can uh, begin. Um, there is a need to address corruption in the country. It's an enormous problem. Um, and again, there are people in the international community uh, who are trying to work uh, on the issue. Um, the other thing that strikes me uh, is that at the end of the, the day, it is really the Africans who must find solutions to African questions. I think the fact that IGAD and the African Union with the support from the United Nations uh, have been involved in the last year is enormously important uh, and we need to see that continue. I, I feel as a US diplomat who served in, in Sudan uh, that we did a number of good things, but at the end, I really see the Africans as having a greater role. Finally, um, it's up to the South Sudanese to decide whether South Sudan can be a unified nation. Um, I often think of former Yugoslavia. Uh, nobody tried to bring it all together. In the end, there are such historical and ethnic and cultural differences uh, that it may be that a unified South Sudanese uh, state is not possible. I have some optimism because I think at the end of the day, as we've seen in Africa and countries like Rwanda and Liberia, they have emerged, they have come back from the ashes of civil war and institutional destruction and genocide and become successful again. I hope that South Sudan can do the same. So to answer my question, you probably guessed this, um, I do think peace and prosperity can come to South Sudan. I have enormous affection for the people and I hope that will come about. Thank you all very much. Yeah, we, do have, we have time for some questions and what I will do, unless you're really loud, I'll repeat the question um, so that everyone can hear it and then also so that our camera or our microphone can pick it up. So yes, questions? Um, good question. So, Salva Kiir is, you said you were hoping that the leaders at some point step down, but Salva Kiir kind of is like the Fidel Castro that led the separation of Southern <coughs> Sudan from South Sudan uh, when the ethnic conflict between Arabs and the uh, sub-Saharan population was arousing. So I think that it's really important to find this figure of unity to continue the process of democratization and to stabilize the state, the modern state of South Sudan. So I would love to hear your insight based on your experience about why you think that um, Salva Kiir, Kiir should step down. Well, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, during the war, actually, it was John Garang who was viewed as the, the father of the country. He died in an air crash, uh, air crash helicopter crash. Some people have conspiracy theories about that. Salva Kiir took over the role. Uh, he certainly was part of the independence movement. Um, there was a sense when I was in Sudan, uh, and this came from people who were advocates for the South, uh, like George Clooney and John Prendergast, uh, that Salva Kiir was not corrupt that there was great corruption, but that somehow Kier was not part of that. Um, we had a different view in the embassy. We, we could see the corruption. We reported on it. Uh, we were often criticized by people like George Clooney, um, by people like Nick Kristof writing about Sudan. Um, at the end of the day, I think what we saw with Kier was once independence came, he became an authoritarian. Uh, and his abuses against his own people 
including the corruption, really became enormous. Um, I think that at this point, I, I don't see a solution to these two people, but they really do hate each other. Kier has tried to kill Machar two or three times uh, and almost done it, particularly in 2016 when they were fleeing to Democratic Republic of, of Congo. So if somehow they can get through this three-year period, if there can be civ civic education leading up to the elections, because elections in themselves don't mean anything, then yeah, maybe we can see this through. But I have to say that the view of Kier, and you saw the picture that was up there, Salva Kier uh, is wearing a black Stetson. That black Stetson was given to him by George W. Bush. Bush invited him to the White House about the time of independence, gave him the hat. Uh, when Salva Kier took off the hat, I couldn't recognize him. I mean, he wears it all the time. It, it, it was a period when we had a more positive view of him, even though those, in, those of us in the embassy didn't have quite that view. So I don't know. I mean, Fidel Castro at a certain point did retire. Um, we had a family dynasty in Cuba that continued. But I, I have reservations about what he can accomplish based on what we've seen, his style of government, his corruption, and his brutality. Yeah, please. Uh, why Norway's interest in, in uh, South Sudan? Norway, for some reason, through its missionaries, um, became involved. And this continued. The Norwegian government provided assistance. When I was in South Sudan, uh, or in Sudan, uh, you know, my, one of my interlocutors was at the Norwegian embassy. They took almost a separate role in Africa. I mean, I, I can't think of any other place where Norway is so involved. But part of it came out of the missionary effort. Part of it came out of other assistance. And I, I have to say that I, I have tremendous admiration uh, for, for Norway. Uh, this is a country that really believes in the future, that continues to be involved. So it, it is something of an anomaly. Um, but I found them to be good counterparts uh, in the work that we were doing. Who else? Yeah, gentlemen, way in back. What was the uh, original governing structure that they were putting in place? What was the original governing structure they were putting in place uh, after separation from uh, North Sudan? Well, they had had their own legislative body. Um, they had a very high percentage of women. I think it was 30% uh, that were part of that body. They had various ministries. Uh, but... Having said all of that during that six year period, and I was working with USAID people, um, it was hard to see much progress uh, in terms of institution building. Um, $12 billion was an enormous amount of money from oil revenues, and yet we just weren't seeing it. And they were depending a lot on donors to provide training and other assistance. Um, Theoretically, uh, that governing structure could have worked, but as Peter Martel said, it was pretty weak. And once the two sides you know, began fighting, once the money dried up, when they cut off the oil, the whole thing collapsed. So I look back sometimes as being part of that uh, from 2008 to 2010. That was a crucial period. Um, Maybe we could have done something differently. Maybe we could have worked in ways that created stronger institutions. I don't know. But um, I have to say that personally I was shocked when the whole thing collapsed. And that has led to my own second thoughts of what did I miss? Um, maybe I could have played a stronger role. That's often the case when you're a diplomat. But. Um, it was just hard to say. The structure might have worked had it been stronger. Who was it? Was it a parliamentarian or like the United States? Was it? it was basically a parliamentary um, structure. Um, so it had, uh, but it was a mixed parliamentary structure in that it also had a president and a vice president and ministers. 
Um, the SPLM, which was the governing party, had the overwhelming uh, power. So the legislature was not very strong. Um, and Salva Kiir did a very good job of freezing out people around him. Um, so it, it could have been a stronger structure than it was. But, you know, some, sometimes when you're, you're a diplomat, you, you stand back and you think, at the end of the day, it was up to the South Sudanese. And a lot of people tried to make it work. Uh, it didn't work. Um, maybe some of the things that we offered were Western institutions and structures. Uh, it could have been that a structure based more on indigenous institutions or beliefs would have been stronger. It's hard to say. Um, I think in some ways having the US, Norway, and Great Britain step back at this point is a good thing because I think Africans need to work with the South Sudanese to see if the country can come back together. Well, so that's, that's the end of our official uh, time right now, but I invite you to do two things. <coughs> One thing is to come up and ask questions, Please. Uh, perhaps individually, and the second thing is to thank Ambassador Esquino for coming. Thank you. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it. <laughs>